Hey guys, just a quick note before we jump into this recording of Office Hours. Office Hours are brought to you by Ride IQ. Every week, Ride IQ members are invited to join us for a conversation with a Ride IQ coach or guest expert about an important equestrian topic. That's Office Hours and getting weekly direct access to equestrian professionals at the top of their field through Office Hours is a perk of the Ride IQ membership, but at its core, Ride IQ is a mobile app with hundreds of on-demand, listen while you ride audio lessons, top by top of venting, jumper, and dressage coaches. In other words, with Ride IQ, you can take a lesson from an incredible coach during any ride you'd like. Whether you're looking to add structure to your rides or try new exercises or build confidence, Ride IQ can help. Membership is only $29.99 per month, and every membership automatically includes a two-week unlimited access free trial. Try it for yourself today by downloading the Ride IQ mobile app on iPhone or Android. Welcome to Ride IQ. This recording of Office Hours is a bonus episode from Monday, July 25th. A live interview with high performance managers Richard Waygood and Graham Tom, hosted by Ride IQ coach and Canadian Olympic event rider Kyle Carter. Richard Waygood previously served as performance manager for the British dressage team. Under his leadership, the team won gold at the 2012 Olympics in London and team silver at the 2016 Olympics in Rio. Richard then became the performance manager for the British eventing team and has led the team to several medals, including gold at the 2018 World Equestrian Games, gold at the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo, and gold at the 2021 European Championships. Graham Tom spent five years as a New Zealand high performance eventing manager and led the team to a gold medal finish at the 2018 FEI Nations Cup at Aachen. From 2007 to 2014, Graham was the Canadian eventing high performance manager and led the team to Team Silver at the 2010 World Equestrian Games. You can read more about Richard and Graham in the episode description. We hope you enjoy this bonus episode of Office Hours. Hey everyone, welcome to our live public forum for Ride IQ. Uh, really excited about today's um, it's office hours, but it's more of a conversation between two uh, incredibly successful managers and chef to keeps for um, for actually one for multiple nations and one for two different disciplines, which you just never see. And we've got Dickie Waygood and Graham Tom here today. Both of them have been instrumental in providing um, structure and instruction to creating success for programs all the way up to the international level earning medals from these, um, from their, from their guidance. So I'm hoping that, uh, you guys all enjoy this today's talk. I'm sure that, uh, Graham and Dick, are going to make this really fun and educational. And, um, we're going to kind of go through a bunch of questions that we have for people that we never really get to talk to because everybody kind of knows the riders and things, but it's not very often, you know, how much is going on behind the scenes and how instrumental the behind the scenes are for the team success. And we really want to kind of focus on that today. Um, Richard right now, Dickie right now is uh, in charge of the event and managing the event team for England at the moment. He was the manager for the British dressage team as well. Graham was a Canadian chef to keep and manager um, back in the, early 2000s to um, a medal winning performance in the, at the WEGS and then went on to great success with New Zealand managing um, their team until recently. And now he's just lazy and doesn't work. Um, but uh, so just to fire this off, because we want to kind of get people to understand what the, what the position is first, which is, you know, what is the job of the chef to keep and manager? Um, just starting with that so that, so that people know what they're getting into today. Why don't we start with you, Graham? Tell me about the job. Um, well, the first thing I would say is uh, thanks very much for having us. And thanks to uh, Jessica and Kinsey for setting all this up. Um, happy to be here. As far as the uh, chef jobs go, they're different, really. There's no uh, fixed template for each nation on how they do it. Um, the broad brush would be, uh, as, as a specific example, uh, Dickie does coaching in addition to a lot of the organizational stuff and things that, that, that I do, and I don't do any of the coaching. Um, I, my role is a general manager role. Um, and so it is all the way from initial um, budgeting 
uh, hiring of staff, overseeing the staff, which includes coaches, selectors, a horse health team, a vet physio farrier, um, you know, obviously liaising with the riders, um, dealing with uh, admin people that um, um, to, to get set up for major games. Um, and, and I would say very clearly at the beginning, because we're going to talk for an hour and I don't want anybody to misconstrue that everything's being done by me. There's always a team of a good, you know, dozen or so people that make it all happen behind the scenes. Um, and um, so between the rider setup, scheduling, um, training and clinics, hiring staff, budgeting, uh, with an eye all the time towards the next major championship, which for us is every two years, or sorry, us, <laughs> when I was with the Kiwis, it was every two years. Uh, we don't participate, or the Southern Hemisphere of Nations don't participate in the European Championships, um, which fall in the same sort of category as the Pan Ams. The, um, so that's about it. I mean, it's, um, it's an all-encompassing role. It's a full-time role. And uh, it's really, and then outside of those basic things, there's always tangents that you go off on as far as um, special projects, um, visas, uh, things like that. And Dickie, you would kind of your role, like Graham said, is slightly different. So, what do you would you be adding into that or subtracting from that? No, I think um, you know Graham summed up the sort of role really well. But I think there's a few other bits. You know, there, there's a lot of uh, within the role. Basically, the key is communication. Uh, and that's pretty much in all, all the roles, whether you're a coach or team leader, or however you want to put it, as back uh, comms. But then in addition to that, um, Graham slightly is underestimating his own uh, importance there around the team leading, because there's many different leadership styles. But in these roles, you're very much leading from the back um, because you've got you're working with a lot of uh, very successful individuals. And those six successful individuals have, have got there in their own right. So what you're trying to do with that group of highly motivated people is, is sort of lead them in a way that uh, you empower them and it keeps them, uh, keeps their confidence. And it, it, at the same time, when everything goes wrong, then that's the time to sort of lead from the front rather than the, than, than the back. So that's, that's a really important part of the role, but it's a really hard part of the role to write down and to explain. And that's very much about the, uh, the individual sort of uh, uh, character philosophy around becoming a performance manager. And, and that word performance manager, a, a lot of the role, although Graham you know, just spoke about there's the logistical side, but then there is the performance side and the, and the way that you can influence performance and that's very much from you know you're not when you employ in staff your farrier isn't just the farrier your team physio is not just a, 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 a physio they are a fundamental part of that performance and creating a po positive environment which then you can bounce off and, and the athletes feel feel confident in and likewise you know your grooms are a real fundamental part and and in in life you know, in, in all of those those teams and in life, but you know, leaders are people that can influence people. So at all levels, you have influencers. And it's really important that everybody's nose is pointing in the same direction. And that's something that Graham does quite naturally and does very well because we work close together. We've talked a lot. I've seen how the, you know, how the Kiwis work. And, it, and it's something that's really hard to write down. It's something that's hard to weigh. It's something to hard to measure. It's just basically stuff that you probably do quite naturally. Um, so that's a part of the role. And then the, the other part for me is the coaching part, which I've really, really enjoyed my coaching. Um, that really motivates me. Um, and so that, there's the, the sort of coaching element of the, of the role as well. But then that's really important to understand that, you know, you, you're, you're, you won't fit everybody. And it's trying to have a very flexible bespoke program that, that that suits each athlete which i touched on earlier the athletes are highly motivated and they've got their really under their own steam so a lot of your role is just to keep that keep that momentum up 
Well, so that actually is great, a great lead into to a different question, which was uh, sort of what do you, who are you, who do you, are you responsibly the conduit between owners, riders, farrier, physio, and everybody and making sure that those pathways stay open, stay positive, drawing everybody into a, into a team mentality, because you are dealing with, like you said, like people have gotten there very successful. Um, they've done it, you know, everybody does it with a group, but they do it on their own sort of terms. And I remember um, Bettina Hoy said to me one time when we were talking about coaching, she said when Christopher Bartle went into Germany, he, he sat them all down and said, the one thing that has to happen is you have to be willing to change to be able to draw the next level of, of success up. And he was talking to people that were very successful. So what is your, is your job as the manager to do all of that? Or do you make sure you have people in place to take care of that type of thing? No, I think, again, is the team manager. You are the glue that really holds it together in lots of ways. And um, uh, words are really everything that we're talking about. <laughs> just words, but it's actually the action that you actually live, live by the words so that you, you, you speak and you try to keep that one team uh, mentality. And also it's really recognising that with the um, – we you just spoke about, you know, again, I'll reiterate it, a very successful – groups of people and around those people they have very good home teams and whether that's their home coach home farrier etc etc so it's also recognizing the the uh, impact that those home teams have on the athletes whether it's the coach whether it's the physio whether it's their groom and understanding that, that they work really independently for that's for argument's sake let's say 300 and you know 58 days of the year and then for seven days a year we pull them together for a championships so by putting people into that environment you can if you're not careful create a a, a pressure cooker or a pressure pot that could explode at any time um so managing that in in, in a way because it's not how ever you look at it is not a team sport as in everybody is going on the field to play together passing the ball to be, together and and working in that way as a team it's got a completely different di dynamic as we know so that does take a, a certain skill and we're only human we don't always get it right uh, we strive to get it right and we don't always get it right yeah i would just um add to that um which is absolutely accurate i always would compare it to the Ryder cup in golf where you have individuals that compete creating their own living, et cetera. And then you pull them together once every two years uh, and say, okay, you're a team for the next two weeks. Um, and that's not easy to do. And, and, you know, you also have to recognize we didn't create the riders as Tiki was saying earlier, they, they got to these levels generally on their own. Sure. They had assistance on the way up to some degree, but, um, you know, they carved their success, the top ones, you know, out of granite themselves. And I guess when I answered the first question, it was sort of more about the structure and everything. And then Dickie touched on style. And I would say that from a it is very difficult to articulate whether, you know, you're good at management or not. And, how, and if you are, how you do it. Um, I remember... Um, the head of General Electric once saying that it's amazing how much I learn when my lips aren't moving. And I think that's true for, for management. <laughs> um, if you're surrounded by great people, starting first with the athletes and the horses, um, you just have to really always remember to get out of their way and let them do, as Dickie said, leading from the back, let them do what they're good at because they're there. They have expertise in areas that, that we don't. Um, you've brought them in because they're part of the team. They're going to affect performance. Um, and definitely the grooms really are the backbone to this. And then all the other staff uh, employed by the team make that happen. Um, and I think that's the essential thing really to, to what makes it work. You cannot step in and start <laughs> steering the ship when it's, when it's unnecessary. Right. And so when you're when you're looking at that, you also are looking at, I mean, one of the difficult things in our sport, I believe, in coaching, uh, especially in that situation, is you're coaching people that are adults that have made life decisions. Some of them have kids. Some of them have 
I mean, they're like, you're going to have people that are really established in their mentality. It's a lot more difficult than starting with a young rider and molding them into something. And so when you're trying to work with that, how much do you look for riders that, that like in a team situation? And I mean, we all know of teams that self-destructed because they had like one or two people on there that just were the were acid and just constantly blew things up. So when you're when you're looking at your program, how do you manage that type of those situations, those personalities? Because you got to you have to have them. Some of them are are great riders that just don't sit, you know, play well with others into these environments and to get the best out of them on, on those days. What do you what do you factor in there? And Graham, you can take that one because <laughs> well, because well, I, I actually, you know what, to, to be perfectly honest, and I'm not dodging the question, I haven't really bumped into that. Um, sure, there's been friction every now and then, but I haven't had what you describe as this acid personality that's ever been involved in a team environment. I mean, I've really been fortunate that every, and I've been to, if you include Pan Ams, I don't know, on seven, eight games now, and I have to say that I have never left one at the end of it saying, boy, that was a horrible experience. I wish so-and-so hadn't been here, whether it's an athlete or a staff member. Staff's easy. You can always put them on a plane. Um, but I've never had to do that. And I've always really been appreciative of, of people. You know, sure, there's friction on the way in because everybody wants to be on the team and you're only going to have four people there out of the great numbers that you start with. Um, but when they get in there, as I say, I've, I've, I've always seen people pull together and, and, um, and respect the environment and, and really be team players. So I guess I've just been lucky. Yeah. So what about you, Dick? You have any prima donnas that you've had to manage or is this also just, you've just been fortunate and all the right people are in place all the time? No, I, th I think the, the, the bottom line of it is, is during your journey, and the sort of path, pathway, if you want to call it, to the games is the big focus. So you work back through that. You know, you, you get to know the individuals and they know each other really well. And, you know, personally, I've got exactly the same as Graham, really. Any any of those sort of turbulence or issues are, are well, not even issues, but they're managed way before you go into that team environment. So... And, it, and it's basically, if everybody, again, we talk about this community, you know, talked about communication earlier, but if you can communicate and everybody sort of then basically, this is what you can expect from us, this is what we expect from you, you've dealt with everything and, and you've set sort of very simplistic guidelines before you get to a championships. So everybody knows really how they, how they, how they should act. And the other thing is within, we spoke earlier, not everyone goes onto the field of play together. But in most cases, 99% of cases, you want everybody within that environment to do well because it, it means the difference between winning a team medal and an individual medal. And in realistic terms, you can go to a championships on many occasions and not have individuals that are capable of a um of an individual medal they might be an outside chance but as a team when they work together with their combined scores they really could be um effective and and, and are you know a, a good each way bet for an indiv uh, for a team medal so they they get it you know they're they're they you know athletes really get it um so you know then you spoke earlier about the owners um the grooms the staff Yes, you are the sort of glue and the conduit between all of those, but exactly the same. You manage all those expectations before you get to a championships. This is what you can expect from us. This is what uh, we'd expect from you. And all of that is done before you, 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 you hit the tarmac. Yeah, I would just like to add to that too, because the, the, the communication that Dickie's talking about is definitely the backbone of everything. And you have to preempt it. You don't want to ever have to react to something. Um, because then, then you're a step behind. And by that, I mean, no, I, I was in both countries that I've worked with, blessed with sort of lower numbers. As an example, I think the, the British team, um, the group that, that Dickie ran, you know, they had a, a hun approximately 150 qualified combinations for Tokyo. And I think we had 29. 
Um, so that's, you know, just the, the depth of numbers makes communication styles different. I, I had the ability to what I would call these roundtable dinners slightly infrequently, but they, but they, but they were there and we would get together with the top squads, have a dinner, discuss things. This is where we're going. This is what isn't working. This is what's working. Get all their feedback and have a great dialogue and exchange and then act upon it. And then as you're heading into the championships, as Dickie said, I mean, the amount of information you want to push forward early to say this is what to expect, not just from the logistics side, but from behavioral uh, uh, performance expectations. You know, let's not all think we're going to do a PBs across the board. And, and then scores. And as Dickie said, you might be going into a situation where you don't have an individual medalist, but if everybody can, Tokyo is an example, if everybody could finish on a sub 33, um, you're going to win a medal. But you won't win an individual medal, perhaps, but you're going to win a medal, a team medal. And those sorts of things well in advance of expectations and um, just as they say, the behavioral side as well, and then everybody's happy. Ish. So what, something like it's it's really I I'm a fan of the sport, and I've been involved in different programs in different capacities and things. Um, but I will say straight up that I think that you both are probably finding yourselves in a unique position there, and I think that actually speaks to what you guys are what you're capable of doing and what you're about more than it does. I'm, look, I'm not like I'm sure your teams might have worked towards that anyways, but I don't think that that's necessarily the norm. I think that it says something about your management style that you actually are able to diffuse those things going into it, um, because most of the time that isn't the case. It just doesn't happen. So that's a, you know, a feather in your cap to be able to do that. And you probably aren't even aware you're doing it. Well, I, I think as well, though both of us have are working with athletes or have been working with athletes um, at the very, very pinnacle of the sport. And with that comes a different mindset. Um, you know, that with that comes a degree of professionalism. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not citing the ones that are number 40 in the world at all. Don't get me wrong. But, but when you're dealing with the very best in the sport who have built businesses, you know, or in their mid thirties, early forties, have just got this um, base that they're working from. They come with an ideology and a professionalism and a desire to win um, that makes your role not not necessarily easier, but you're already one sort of step ahead of the game. You're not you're not molding as many personalities as you think you have to. Does that make sense, Dicky? Yeah, and, you, and you know the point that Graham makes there. You're not pushing people forward; you're holding them back. If anything, yeah, uh, that's a good uh, way to put it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you know, in equestrian terms, you're half altered. You're not. Um, you're not trying to motivate people. Um, so I think you know the, there's there's that, and also you know life's all about confidence, and that's exactly the same for a coach, for a team manager, to an athlete. To the grooms it's about confidence and you know that the there's that wonderful uh saying i use all the time but life's battles don't always go to the faster or the stronger man or woman they normally go to the person who thinks they can who believes and that confidence bit is really really important and then the other thing that's you know quite tough for us at the moment the um you know with tokyo and europeans and you know, the where previous WEG, you know, we're, we've got a target on our back. So, you know, that, you know, we have to, this is where the hard work really starts. And anybody that says to me they're living the dream or they've made it, then I am absolutely, they're stagnating. And right. the moment you're living the dream, you're not, you're not progressing. So you're almost just as you feel like you get there, then the tempo ups again and you're off and you're on this, this constant hamster wheel. And Graham would, will say you know it's tiring isn't it it's it, it, it it's not easy to keep that evolved bit because that's the absolute key don't live the dream right until you want to retire yeah. <laughs> or 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 instead of retiring quitting 
<laughs> I always, I always felt like I was about 15 years behind. I still do. I'm probably 20 years behind now. I think, well, if I'd ridden this well and it was 15 years ago, then I'd be doing quite well. But unfortunately, that's just not, it's always ahead of you, not behind you. So with that, you're dealing obviously with this group of athletes. If you've got your elite, elite athletes, you've both been fortunate enough to work with that level. Where are you drawing them from? How far ahead are you looking for? There's going to be a, a few questions, but how far ahead are you looking with those riders? And there'll be an, you know, sort of the idea, but also we'll talk about horses in a minute. Um, and then how far ahead are you planning with them to maybe replace your next, your, your, your top riders? Is that something you have to deal with or is that sort of on everybody's own responsibility? It, it, it's a good question. And I don't think there is an exam book, you know, uh, answer to that because, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the, the Brits are very different from the Kiwis and as with, with the uh, American in the US and a little bit. The, the first thing is, is, you know, the, the longevity in equestrian sports is completely bonkers. You know, if you, you look, you've got Andrew Hoy, you know, who is riding better than ever, you could say, and where he's at in his career. You know, I'll, I'll flash back to um, to Rio and Nick Skelton in jumping, winning a gold medal at 58 years old. Um, so that longevity bit is, is, is quite incredible. That can make it hard for the, for the younger athletes coming up. But then it links in with horsepower and it is a business. And you need, you know, good horses make good riders, but it's having a string of, uh, of if, if the pyramid starts wide at the bottom, having your five and six year olds and then your seven year olds and then eight year olds and constantly having youngsters coming through to support the top end of the py pyramid. So in equestrian, it absolutely isn't just about the athlete. It's about the combination. And about the horsepower so you have to have a business of equestrianism and understand how that strategic part of the uh the job is in, important if you cannot fulfill that business side the business aspirations then you won't fulfill your competition aspirations but then you then also need to invest in the in the younger athletes and we're very lucky we have good youth you know, pony club, then into ponies, then into the juniors, then into the young riders. But then there is a gap. And that gap when the uh, when our athletes move out of young riders, then then that is a quite a tough time for them because they're then suddenly standing on their own feet. They've got to make sure, as I said before, the business aspirations are looked after. And that's something where we have a few different systems now with what we call bridging the gap um there's another one called the four star academy and we then have what we call the p3 program which is part of the world class program our lottery funding and that really is an educational program everything from what you need to drive a horse box to insurances to employment laws to coaching in the arena to pressure analysis with saddle refitting and it is a really good educational part. And then you hope from there, some of those last and come through, and then they are your future. I've talked a lot, Graham, so over, over to you. Most teams always, you know, or, the, or the, the winning team cycle, and that's usually a function of horses all showing up wonderfully at the same time, and you won through two quadrennials and, and do well, and then all of a sudden you're – down and fourth, fifth for a couple of generations or a couple more quads, and then you're back um, either through rejuvenation of horses or or different riders. Uh, I recently did a little bit of a back of an envelope um, research thing for, for some people, and um, I went back eight, eight games, uh, Worlds and Olympics, and so 24, looking at teams, uh, so 24 medal possibilities. And out of those 24 medal possibilities, each one of those teams, 19, I think it was, out of the 24 teams, and again, this is back of the envelope stuff, 19 of those 24 teams had a majority, two or more out of four, didn't 
and included the last one, which was three, two or more seasoned veterans on the team. So, right. so the experience, the team experience is really, really important. It, it's proven. And, and in most cases, those other sort of five teams that had majorities but didn't win medals or whatever, or, or sorry, the newbies, in most cases, the rookies on the teams of those years were the discard scores. So trying to keep a majority of experienced people on teams is really important. You don't want to have them fall off all at once, but at the same time, you want to bring some people in so you can keep it, keep it rolling in a way. The pathway is the cool phrase for the beginning to podium um, that you want to develop, but that really begins outside of obviously of high performance where the young riders, et cetera, that Dickie alluded to before. For, for, for me, um, as a high performance manager, it's always tricky. What, what, where do you put the pin in to say this is where a high performance starts? And I've always sort of said it starts at the advanced level. Um, you obviously have an eye and you're paying attention to what's coming at the intermediate level um, that will make the next step. And then you try to embrace that and, and pull them all in. But, but for sure, um, medal winning teams demand to have experienced riders on it. So would you suggest, and this is for, for both of you, and let's say, Graham, you go first with that. So would you suggest when you're thinking about bringing in your, your new rider on a team of your new riders and you're hoping to, to get them comfortable in those pressure situations, you're hoping to build them to be future um, contenders, consistent contenders in the sport, you're good you would want to bring them in in a team of four to put one in with three veterans, two in with three, with two veterans in an ideal world. Obviously we know, God knows sometimes it's like, we just got to grab what's there, but what do you think the good combination is there? Well, before they changed the Olympic structure, I would have said that in general, in general, um, you know, you see basically somebody show up with, um, you know, a world beater of a horse or something. But in general, I would say you would want to put one in with three or one or two in with two, but but don't tip the scale the other way. And then further protect them at the games because if it's somebody's first games, they all come in, they've done well um, at venues in Europe and so on, um, where they're with their friends, where they're part of the circus that goes around from show to show and they're comfortable. But it is a different different feeling when you walk onto an Olympic venue and there's a multitude of sports going on, there's an athlete village, there's flags all over the place, there's TV, there's hype, there's so much more preparation that's gone through um, with riders and everything and athletes uh, from all different nationalities are competing against so many more different flags that when they're there, you also, you really got to bring the team and you've got to make sure that those seasoned veterans are also having an eye out for those, um, you know, rookie riders. And, um, and I always think that, it's, you know, I don't care, but um, it'd be interesting for Dickie, but, you know, put them, put them number two in the lineup, you know, let them, don't put them out number one, let them see a trailblazer go out, come back with a nice positive result. And then they get to take a breath. And in a, in a way, the pressure's not on them in that spot. So don't, um, and just things like that to uh, make sure that they're always looked after. You have to check in with them a little bit more and, and do a little more of that stuff. But uh, also you don't want to, you know, overdo it. <laughs> yeah. Um, because it's, you know, they're, they're not kids. And so when you're, when you're looking at, at introducing those, because again, you are dealing with a smaller group of riders. So when you're bringing them in, do you, you're, are you looking for, you're, are you ideally looking for them after they've had two or three at the level? Oh, well, I think at the end of the day, Kyle, they, they, they have to earn their spot just like anybody else. Nobody gets brought in just because they're new or just because they're young and that we think in the future that we want to give them this experience. The Olympics and the world's, I mean, maybe with the individual spot at the world's, but, but as far as the Olympics go, there's, there's no room for, 
Um, you, you put your, it's a meritocracy and it is 100% the best are going and the best results are going. And if it happens to be a new kid on the block, as far as um, being a rookie at a major game, so be it. And then you work around that situation. Well, and so Dickie, with your, with your, what you've, what you've been managing for the last however long you're drawing and it had to be very different from your dressage experience, but you're drawing it. It's got to also be there. Everybody looks at England and goes, Oh, well, how, how lucky for them to have such great depth. But at the same time, you're going to be leaving behind people that like can fill those spots. It's got to be really difficult to try to manage that end of it. What do you, what do you find in that? Yeah. I mean, the challenge, you know, the, 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 the the different challenges really with team GB is you, you, first of all, you know, event and it is sort of how you look at it. Can, you can call it the garden of event in here. And that's why, you know, uh, Graham spent a lot of his time here because uh, a lot of the Kiwi riders and foreign riders come and base themselves here. Um, the challenges we have is you have a lot of people fighting for very few spaces and it sounds uh, fab, but you know you've got to ask yourself: Is badminton the best pathway to an, an Olympic Games? Um, and is you know it, it, is is a five star always the best way? Um, games we know are, are on the surface. We know or championships are on the surface, and at the same time. You know, badminton is quite high risk. It, it, it's you know the, the 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 sort of top of the top, and it comes early in the year. So, I've in my ideal world was the with the COVID year being a little bit ahead of the game and getting um, Victon and um, Aston Lewis to step in and do the five four star shorts. They were basically the. the I, if I could have written the pathway to the games for the best prep for our horses, that, that was the pathway. So the challenge we have is we can't say to one athlete, don't go to badminton, because if that athlete doesn't go and then athlete number B wins and they're put ahead of them, we foul play. So having large numbers, is, it, it, it sounds great, but it does throw up his own challenges. I wouldn't want to change it, but it does throw it up its, uh, its own challenges. Um, so that's just that's just one one, one example. Do you um, now when you were when you were managing the dressage team, you had a it was a different scenario. Obviously, you were you came into a position, and I, I mean from the outside, all of a sudden, you know, Great Britain was. The, the strongest nation in the world. Like they, it didn't, it just, the whole, to me from the outside, the, the riding all looked just how I, how you want to see it. It wasn't, um, it wasn't just flash. It was consistent. It was like the riding was unbelievable. So you were dealing with really good riders, but you weren't dealing with a medal winning, medal winning um, group. And then you, you stepped in, you kind of, you, you had to, orchestrated stuff there so you'd be in a similar maybe situation to graham for his position in new zealand would you agree with that yeah it was i was very very lucky um first of all when i was asked to do the role it was a big gamble um and it was something we sort of said well we look look ourselves in the eye after uh, a few months and i shadowed richard davison for a few months and then we decided that we're, you know, whether it was the right thing to do after that, because I was coming in from the outside into dressage. But 90% of that job for me was managing character. Right. So that, you know, and especially around that leading from the back, I was very, very fortunate. You know, dressage had the influence, first of all, of uh, Wilfred Brecklesteimer, Laura Tomlinson's father, who had a big influence on Carl. Carl was already having a great influence on the sport globally, um, not just with his actual riding, but also with his coaching. And so I was very, very lucky. I just you know, stepped into that role when we were just about to go in this fairy tale, basically eight years. And it, it was quite an incredible thing to be a part of um, and to be, like I say, part of that fair, fairy tale. 
And, you know, we go back to, interestingly enough, uh, what Graham was saying about the different dynamics within the team and different riders and getting to know when they come together. And there was a, a, a lot of, if you want to call it a nice way, but there was some dressage din dynasties. There were, and, and those dynasties over here, you know, the Albergs are fantastically successful. The Becklesteimers, fantastically successful. I'm just naming a few. And then you had Carl, fantastically successful. But when they all came together, when all the noses were pointed in the in the same direction, they were an inc incredible group of people motivated to work to, to work with. But again, the role very much with that team was the, yes, the admin and the logistics, but the key part was actually managing character. Well, and it did look like in... To your favor, I, I mean, obviously, Carl is it has been very influential for for a very long time, but he he certainly comes across like in a smaller group the right sort of personality for leadership. Like he is going to bring people along with them rather than be, you know. I and this is a little bit what I see in the dressage teams a lot of times that you have that one you know rider who they're like i'm the pinnacle and everybody else they have to stay beneath me and he just seemed not to have that in him okay there's there's, there's two things around around carl is first of all he is such a nice person he's a great character uh he's witty he's charming and he has everything that i don't have um but you know he's 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 got wit he's charming and he's a natural leader um obviously the way that he's worked with Charlotte. But the main thing about Carlos is the fact that he's, he's selfless. Right. And he put his own individual aspirations to one side for the team medal. Yeah. The hardest thing with Carl is once you've passed the team phase of the competition is he's then exhausted because he's put everything into everybody else and he's still then got to compete in the individual. So, yeah. you know, for, for him, so that was a big part of the role as well, trying to put the sort of uh, support network around Carl so he still had enough energy to go and compete for himself after the uh, the team competition. Um, and when we went to Rio, for example, every member of that team, he helped. Yeah. So and incredible. So he was an athlete on the team. And notice I call the... The riders more and more um I, I refer to them as athletes and the reason around that so you know we, they are now very professional the sports and it's not just about you know in, uh, in the old days riders got very very fit but now it's about the proper strength and conditioning strength and conditioning the correct parts of your body your stretch your weaknesses and also nutrition so you can keep you know riding that volume of horses if you want to call it that um so we're, we're in a very different world now in 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 eventing specifically as well and gone are the days really when you see an athlete get into the end of the course and they're not fit enough to to you know not see the red mist to think clearly under pressure da -de -da -de -da. and we are in a very, very different different place now and how professional the actual sport is right yeah no i i mean i think definitely the percentage of of riders treating themselves like athletes has gone from when i started to where it is now it's got to be more like 80 percent, where it was probably 20 percent. hey in my day i can remember entering events on how good the cocktail party was for god's yeah. sake you know <laughs> uh, there was, yeah there was a bit of that sort of mentality and then on cross country day everybody got stuck in you dug in deep but nowadays the quality of of dressage in eventing is mind-boggling. Laura's test at badminton was put on Euro dressage, and they use it on Euro dressage as an example of the correct way of going. Right. That would have been dreamt of five, six, ten years, fifteen years ago. Yeah. Uh, so the standard is, is, is absolutely through the roof. And we talk about now when you look at the, uh, you know, everyone talks about marginal gains, but you know, events are being won or lost on a one time penalty in the show jumping. Right. Well, and it seems like there's a lot more, I mean, there's certainly, uh, you see a lot of riders going into the other disciplines and being successful at the, at the 
top level it was a, it was more of a rarity before obviously there seems to be more show jumping driven um direction for them but it is amazing how how consistent they are riding to be able to go and and do those things and that just comes down to what you're saying about being like actually being accountable as an athlete not just being a, it's a sport i do it's a sport that i'm involved in live and breathe so um well, the, the days of being able to catch up and win after cross country are not the same as they were obviously a dozen years ago um yeah. and now everybody has to hone their skills in at you've got to be fantastic as a combination in every phase you can't just be strong in one and expect to to pull in a team medal even let alone an individual one so so i i, I you know echo what what vicky's been saying you know you've got to fine tune absolutely everything you can't afford a point four of a time penalty in show jumping and uh, you can't let your horse down or your team down by not being fit enough yourself and you have to go that extra mile it wasn't 10 years ago you couldn't find a piece of green lettuce for a human to consume at an event <laughs> yeah. you know? i would actually go one step further because that you, you hear people say that a lot how you have to be good in all three phases but because you can't afford to have a bad one but you honestly you can't afford to have a bad moment in any one of those phases either. You have a bad, you know, your things are going great and you just have that rail down and it's, that's just one, one fence. It's, let's say it's not a, even not a bad ride or anything, but that rail down just took you out of the competition. You're doing it and you miss two flying changes. Well, that's not a bad phase. It's, it's two bad movements. And now you're standing back watching the competition while you're also competing at it. And I think that's, that's really intense when you think about it over three and four days. Well, yeah, and, and also, I mean, you're looking at 10 minute cross country seems to be the thing now. It's gonna be what's in Tony. It was uh, in Tokyo and it was even less than that in Tryon because of expected weather issues that didn't happen. Um, right. So because of that, then there's even added importance to the other two phases now. So what would you, having having that experience that, and this is sort of like when we talked about this, this is really what I was hoping to kind of get to, because what I want is, what I'd love is to get a sense of a template. I know there's not one way to do it because most of the countries that are, are developing sport, um, I did, I helped develop Guatemala's team to the Pan Am Games. Uh, the FEI put a thing together and I worked with that. I worked with Venezuela for a while doing this, a similar thing. Um, they're very different nations than what, say, the Brits or New Zealand, which is a high sporting nation. Um, but they're not lacking for actually good riders and um, quality enough personnel. What would you say that a team developing uh, a nation developing a team first of all how long do you think that takes to happen obviously there's riding going on i'm not talking about like starting from scratch but starting a program and where do you think the emphasis should be for those countries i just want to touch on a couple start, things on this right. so um well the obvious one is first of all how much money do they have um because this is this is not an inexpensive uh, dive into the deep end. This is, this is expensive. And then how much time do you have? And what age and what can you afford on the horsepower? So depending on where you're starting in the horsepower um, side of the equation is going to dictate what your time frame really is. If you're saying what you're saying, which is you're already starting with somewhat capable riders. Um, on the horse front side, one thing talking about pathways is we didn't, we touched a little bit on the pathway of the horses with the um, Dickey's pyramid. Um, but, and person that I think I would really encourage you to get on this um, medium for discussion would be Yogi Breisner. Um, and I had um, Yogi um, develop with others, this um, young horse program in the um, team GB system, which I don't believe still exists, but I had long conversations with Yogi and it's really interesting how different countries approach um, the evolution of their horses. That when you look at, for an example, my Bob, Ingrid Klimke's horse, when it was 
you know, ran something crazy as a five-year-old, like 12 times or 13 times, whereas other nations would have a five-year-old out like two or three times. But then you're getting this base into a horse so much more than what others would do. So I would, I would really study that when you're putting a program together to, to say how long are we going to develop this and how much do we want to have and what, what events and competitions we have available to us that we can use not just for competitions, but also for training and putting um, development into a horse. Um, you know, in most cases, it makes more sense to do that extra intermediate than it does to, to jump up with any uncertainty into advanced um, and those sorts of things. But so basically, I would say, what can you afford on a horsepower side? How much money do you have? And you must make a minimum commitment of a quadrennial to to um, programs that always fail are the ones and and you know ones that only can afford the next year or the next two years and they throw all their resources at this one year and it's almost like they're buying a lottery ticket and so I would say you have to minimum a quad to two okay. but you know, if you're starting with five year olds then it better be two quads <laughs> so and that's I that's sort of the the idea of like how far ahead people have to think. So I'm going to ask Dickie the same question, but Graham, what I want you to do is while I'm talking to Dickie about this, I want you to come up with the number that you think is the right amount financially for a team. <laughs> you can go on, a, you can, but like, these are the numbers that I think are, that people need to get their head around, honestly. So, and I'm going to do the same thing a little bit with you. Dickie. Well, let's We're ask Dickie first, because I, I really want to, I mean, I just so, I, I can, uh, uh, by, by his right. number. Yeah, so they, you know, think of a number and double it. That's probably right. Yes. So I'll, I'll give you an idea to run an uh, uh, to run a advanced horse for a season, and taking into account we've got Brexit at the moment, we've also got inflation is shot through the roof. But it was a you need to run a sort of four star horse upwards. You need around about thirty k. So that gives you in dollars that would be about I'm guessing about thirty eight. Yeah, 50. OK, yeah. so, you know, that gives you an idea of running a horse at top, top, top level. Um, so then um, let's wind back a bit. The point that you know, um, Graham mentioned the name earlier, Yogi Breisner. Yogi had the position before I did. And, and Yogi did, a, 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 as Graham said, some work around that sort of pathway. And statistically the horses that stay at two and three star level bearing in mind the star levels have changed now because two used to be three and da, da, da. but anyway the horses that stay at that lower level for longer accelerate quicker through the four star level and have a longer career at five star level basically and that goes back to any sport you're what you're actually doing is getting the basics right and in any sport, whether you get the basics right, and they're not only the basics, keeping them at that level is the strength and conditioning, building their top lines, all those key muscles, uh, getting the technique correct. So getting the, the, the basics um, uh, correct. But I'll come back to something on technique in a minute. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the other thing is, is with all of the, um, everything that Graham spoke about, is you need to be bespoke. And uh, when I say bespoke, it's very much um, on the ability of your rider, the um, the horse itself, the horse's stage in its career. We all know that a horse, you know, can be a nine-year-old that's actually physically still like a seven-year-old. So it's being a horseman and understanding what the horse needs and then also biomechanically understanding the horse how it is you know whether it's confirmation is top marks or whether it's low marks and where the weaknesses are so that you give the horse the right amount of time that it needs to be able to step to the next level um and then a really good you know sort of point that graham brought up is around training venues because nowadays you know we we trained our horses cross country rain hunter trials that, you know, or out hunting. But nowadays you have the most amazing schooling facilities where you can do a lot of your training on a surface. That's just one element. 
but you've got to get them onto onto grass. You've got to get them onto slopes. But we have so many venues in this country that you can go and hire. And, you know, I can think of one that springs to mind that would have over 300 fences in, in on, a, on a postage stamp. So, but the key around all of that is being a horseman to understand uh, that bespoke program around each horse and, it, and, it, and each rider. Because it's very, very easy to just go that step too far and to break confidence or to create a, um, you know, a, a veterinary issue um, with, 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 with a horse. So bespoke program, you know, keeping them at the lower levels for a bit longer, getting the basics absolutely right, that strength and conditioning. And then the next bit you have of the jigsaw, and again, you can we can play a game on this, but it's technique versus character. Right. And you only need enough technique to get the job done. So, for example, if you get a row of 7.5s from beginning to end of the test, you're in the shout. But yeah. if you... It's no good having a nine and then dropping to a two and a three and then going back to a nine. That, that's, you know, you only need enough, a, enough technical skills to get the job done. If the show jumping pole is, is um, one meter 10, you only need to clear it by one meter 12 millimeters. Right. And if the show jumping pole is one meter 60, you still only need to clear it by uh what one meter 62 millimeters so again only enough technical skills but what you do need is the character for both the horse and rider to be able to produce that on the field of play under pressure and that character bit is again it's a part of that horsemanship it's a part of coaching it's a part of understanding with team team management is is where people are in their life with their with the character bit and to be able to produce um, that that same performance on the field of play on that day in that 365 day year to produce that over those three days of competition. Um, so all of, all of that for for me, and then now and again you get super character and super talent that come together. So if we look at Vallegro in the uh, in the dressage world, you had you know you had super super talented horse super talented rider in charlotte but super technical skills in both of them and then you get a multi-champion right and just to sort of and when you start throwing those sorts of combination names around it's just reminded me that in this program for as you say if you were to tell a nation how to get from a to b and how long they should plan on it they have to include environment as part of that um and that they absolutely need to experience and let their both horse and rider experience a top level environment and get into Europe and the UK and be amongst the best that you will not succeed unless you do that, in my humble opinion. And I think the stats would back that up. Yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely agree with that because the, the other thing is, well, people, some people have the sort of character naturally, others you need to develop and it, it, it's um, it's a part of their journey in life. Um, but with the ones that have to work really hard at that, the only way they get better is to keep, keep going into the, onto the field of play under that pressure. So the environment that Graham is talking about, uh, about is you you need to you need to practice and train in that environment, and also you need to rub shoulders with 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 the best, um, and it's very very easy. I mean, I'll use this example. What worries me a little bit about Brexit is we go back to that island mentality, and we slowly become isolated, and then we don't you know dip our toe into Europe enough. To be able to make sure that we're 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 still on that upwards trajectory, and then we don't uh, get left behind. Yes, that might take a few years to come about, but I could I could really see that happening. And it's a little bit like you could say being in the states and then coming over this side the pond, and then exposing and and, and rubbing shoulders in 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 Europe or in the in the in the uh, UK. So that is, you know, it's quite a chat, uh, quite a quite a challenge. Um, go on, 
you can ask. But yourself. you're like, so what you're actually, what you just, you just did exactly what I think is what makes you guys unique for your positions is you're talking about, and this is the sort of time frame. When I asked the time frame for developing a team, you just pointed out Brexit and how it would affect you guys, not right now, but in years to come. You're already thinking about how the impact's going to be there, and that's probably six years down the road. So you, you're showing that that forethought that I think is so important to actually have. I think it's an eight-year plan for a developing nation person. I, I I'd agree with that sort of eight-year year year plan, but I think in year twelve you'll suddenly start to really see the benef ben benefits. But the the other thing you you've got to remember with with both of us um where we both work for nations that have funding government funding in the uk it comes via the lottery so we're accountable basically to the public and we're accountable to the uh, to the government um and it gets allocated to us via uk sport so we have a lot of lot of stakeholders but our um we're judged on our performance at olympics so if we don't perform, I can tell you now, talking about looking forward, there isn't a day, an hour, you know, five minutes within an hour that you don't think about the Olympic Games. Right. So you're always, the moment I can remember walking out of the arena with Charlotte when she won her individual gold in London, and we were walking back up the ramp and my head went straight to Rio. And I had to slap myself and say, God's sake, we've only just finished the she's just one of, i'm going to spoil this for everybody yeah. and i take a few days out to celebrate with them and then get on with it you know that pause reflect celebrate and evolve but my head went straight to, to straight to to rio and probably graham I, I, i'll be surprised if he doesn't say the same you're constantly thinking of the games constantly thinking of the games last time round, i couldn't to be honest with you i couldn't see beyond tokyo because i got involved with the uh, jumpers the dressage and our para team so i was in, involved with um all four disciplines and i couldn't see the wood for the trees beyond tokyo if you said to me what are you going to do after tokyo or well, what's your strategy what's your vision i didn't have a clue right. yeah i would have to absolutely echo that the the olympics is where the the funding is based um certainly um when I was with New Zealand, high performance sport in New Zealand, and, and, and New Zealand is is an incredibly sport culture country. I mean, it's fantastic. When you look at it, it really has um, cricket and rugby as their two professional sports. So there's this a massive support and interest and pride that goes into the amateur sport, the Olympic sports, um, and the professionalism around it. And the people at High Performance Sport New Zealand and the New Zealand Olympic Committee were just in, it was incredible. Um, so we had a lot of support, um, which had developed over the years um, with much success. Um, if I name names, I'll forget somebody by mistake, so I won't. But you, you, people know who those big names are in the New Zealand lexicon of, of riders. And, um, and, but we are constantly reminded, you know, if you don't perform, you're going to get cut. And... Uh, and so that's what it is. And as soon as Tokyo, I can understand because Dickie had a massive job in Tokyo looking after he basically was doing two roles. One is the chef de mission, overseeing all the disciplines, all the sports. Plus he had his role with just eventing. So, um, you know, he, he, he was carrying quite a load. Um, so I can see, and especially with Tokyo being two years of organization mm -hmm. where we had this first year and then COVID and then we basically had to restart and reorganize everything else and and a lot of the things changed and um, so on so it was a big big deal but um, I even in Tokyo you're looking already to Paris thinking is this horse and is this rider combination still available or are we going to be swapping a different horse for this rider because we're going to have to do this again in four years and you're you definitely are already looking down that road and so that's so there's two things that i would take away from that that i would because i think they line up very much with how i look at those those jobs the management job the planning of a job that sort of thing which is one it is always cyclic that you're kind of looking for that next thing being willing to actually say this is 
doing it, continuing it with this, say, horse doesn't make any sense because it's never going to pay off. Um, but also the education of like what you were saying about the, the confirmation, spending more time at a lower level. People, especially riders, they rarely want to hear that because everybody, especially when they're younger, is like, I need to get up there so they can pretend that going advanced means they're more competent than when they were going if they went well at intermediate. And so I think in those developing, in nations developing their teams, you have to have that information available for or that structure so that the information is going to the people on what they should be watching for. This horse isn't quite ready yet. He's getting stronger. Give him a little time. This horse is now overripe. Let's make that step up, whatever. Instead of the person having to learn by making all of the mistakes on their own, which is such a painful way to do it, and it's disheartening, and it usually knocks people out of the sport. And I think that there's a little bit um, the issue in most of the countries I see trying to develop teams, if we're looking at trying to develop better teams throughout the world, is that they lack that, or that, that expertise standing there for years on end saying, well, I've seen this rider do these things. At this situation, I'm going to have them make this decision. Or that these horses that are coming on, they, they all seem to peter out at this point, whatever it is. But that doesn't happen without actually having that mileage. And so when you bring in someone for a year or two years to those positions, it doesn't really pay off the way that people want it to because it doesn't give everybody a fair chance of actually understanding how we're going to go forward for the next, what it would be at least a six year step, I would think. Yeah, Dickie. There's nothing fair about elite sport. <laughs> 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 but the, the the but you know I just the, I'll I'll give you something to think about yeah so your athletes need first of all to be authentic to themselves they need to everybody including Graham and myself self uh, Carl coaching we're all experts and we all want to share our knowledge and the athletes have to filter that and decide what's relevant and what's what what's fit fit for their system. The, so that is that filtering that bit and having the confidence to filter it. The, the then the absolute key is they have to have the basics right. Yeah. And then for me getting the basics right, that then creates the system. But the absolute key is if you get the system right, the outcome looks after itself. But you need to be disciplined, absolutely disciplined to stick to the system to get let the outcome look after itself. And then you stick to that discipline. Oh, sorry, you stick to the system and you're disciplined. The discipline turns into fun. Right. But if you're always riding and worried about the outcome, you're always going to your hand. You're always a neutral. You're always riding to avoid a mistake. Yeah. But if you can be disciplined to stick to the system, the outcome starts to look after itself. Well, that makes a lot of sense, especially in developing horses it is hard not to get bogged down in that moment where, damn, I had two rails on it, but it's such a good jumper. What am I going to change instead of just carrying on with the, with a good process that will give you the inevitable outcome, which is hard when you're dealing with owners and, and your ego. Thing. So Graham, did you come up with a number? Um, I'm still uh, working on it. And, uh, but so I'll let uh, Dickie go first and, uh, I mean, it's 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 a it's a difficult uh, it's a difficult one. I mean, it's there's so many so many components that go into a program, and they all cost money. So it's just you know how how big are you, do you want to go from the beginning? Um, you know, it's 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 easy to go to the most successful teams and just right. look at what their budgets are, and then are you making a mistake by saying? If you have that much money, you're going to be successful. <laughs> yeah, no, obviously not. Um, but I would say I, I I don't know what the number is. I mean, I think everybody knows what the cost of of coaching is, what the cost of running a horse, and actually in North America, the cost of running an advanced horse is even more than what it is in Europe um, because of time and travel and uh, entry fees are more in North America and so on. And um, so you really have to just you know. Put it together and 
Are you, are you getting a coach? Are you getting individual coaches? It's just how you structure it. Well, and I think the thing is- I mean, I think that, everybody knows what the, what the base number is for- I don't think know. everybody does know the base number. <laughs> That's why I want to know it. So what do you like? So obviously it's a checklist. You have these different things you want. You want a manager that you're paying for because that way you can be certain to retain. I don't know that you can really start much less than, I mean, and, and look, please don't hold me to this, but I would say I don't know that you could. I will. Oh, well. <laughs> Good. Good. Then Dickie goes. Oh, Graham's so afraid to make a commitment here. I don't know. I just if if I give too low a number and I want to get employed again, then I'm I'm not going to get paid. And if I give too high a number, everybody's going to say he's 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 off his rocker. We don't want him. Do both. Do a, what is a budget? Because there's lots of countries that will not have enough funding, and they will have to settle by spending less on. They'll have to cut some of the program. I mean, all these numbers are actually, you know, what I would encourage people to do is go to uh, the government websites in every country. You can find all the numbers that all the teams are getting somewhere. You have to do a little bit of mining, but, um, you know, it's not hard to really sort of, I mean, you have to do a little bit of figuring out, but to find out what the lottery funding is for Team GB. And and I'm sure you can go on to the sites in Canada and the U.S. and and uh, New Zealand and find out what funding is available from government sources because it all, if it's government funding, it has to be made public. Um, so those numbers are there and I would encourage everybody to go and say, okay, well, this is what the successful teams are, are working off of. But, you know, if, if put it this way, the key, the key components would be um, coaches, a manager, um, admin, um, horse health, um selection which i believe should be paid i started that program they're still underpaid at the museum but i started paying them selection um so those are the the, the most basic of ingredients i think i said horse health right and you know just start with that add up all those costs throw a bunch of travel on top of it and now you're at the bare minimum and i would say as part of that bare minimum um, you want to subsidize riders directly, your top ones, so they can get outside coaching on top of team training and so on. So, you know, you're already, you're already at a fairly good size number. Now, once you get to that number and you say whether we can afford that as the base number, then you can start peeling bits off and, and lower it or you can, you can always throw more money at it, but you can. Dick, you know, he used to be a banker, right? <laughs> <laughs> so Rick, so so Richard, just do you have you have a, obviously? Let's just get your input on that. Do you have a, a number? Or are you? I mean, it, it depends on the cost of living in each country and where you're going to base yourself. Work out from what the you know um, what uh, you know um, national um, uh, hourly rate is for grooms, etc you know, veterinary care, because there's so many overlayers on top on top of this, whether you're going to be based at a centralized camp or whether you're going to be in satellite yards, all of those things, whether athletes are renting yards or whether they're own, their own yards. So there's layers and layers and layers behind all of this. Then whether you've got a force to fly horses every time you go abroad and compete or can you put them on a horse box and go road, road transportation, so where the championships are, if you're going to campaign the nation's cup whether you're after the pan am games asian games so it, it there, there's so many variables around each nation and um, you know if you are able to you know pick a team up and base them all in the uk japanese for example are based over here and in uh, france for example um a lot of kiwi riders are based here and and, uh, and a lot also in in new zealand but uh then again, it, it uh, you, you you look at LA games, for example. Will that bring more event riders to the US to base before uh, you have, have the games in in LA? So there's so many variables, and until you know what you're dealing with, I don't think you can really, you know, you need to just do as Graham said, add of all of put the wish list top notch, and then decide to decide what's a nice to have, what's essential um and and what's going to have most importantly what's going to have a performance impact well okay so then that actually is a perfect sort of 
both of those answers. It's not because the number is going to change in a, in six months or whatever anyways, but that gives us all of the co- all the things that you're expecting out of the program and people can kind of go, gosh, I never thought about the shipping to a nation's cup. I never thought about uh, the financing of the horse care and that sort of thing. And so hopefully that gets people's head around what it's going to take to actually really commit to making say an Olympic performance in six years or something. But um Look, guys, we got to wrap it up. I really appreciate it. Really enjoyed having you on here. Uh, super to get your insights. That was awesome for me. Well, thanks for having us, Kyle. Appreciate it. Thank you, Kyle. And uh, right. Graham. Nice I've not seen this guy for a while. And we, we um, one thing, we were obviously kept our tactics to ourselves, but uh, we became good friends over the last sort of five years. And we, uh, we communicated quite a lot and we did a sort of work together quite closely on any issues that we felt. And, uh, and, uh, I'd have to say, you know, he, he, he's, 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 he has lots of words of wisdom and, uh, and I think that we made a good team. Um, and, uh, we, we, we somehow navigated through game, didn't we? And got, got our way, our own way a lot of the time. <laughs> we did. And I have to give a nod to Dickie as well, because I have a, a mountain of respect for him and, uh, and I really enjoyed all our conversations and getting through Tokyo was it almost felt like he and I were, were there together. <laughs> yeah, it was really good. And the Brits are very lucky to have him. Well, you're both great uh, communicators. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. I tried yeah. to get him to come and work for us. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cheers, guys. See you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Office Hours. Before you go, I'd love to tell you a little more about Ride IQ. With Ride IQ, you can get guidance from an incredible coach anytime you want. No need to deal with hauling or scheduling or budgeting. Our members always describe it best, and one of our members, Lauren, recently said, Ride IQ has absolutely reinvigorated me to pursue excellence with every ride. The lessons provide much needed direction, purposeful exercises and reminders to keep me in check while also asking my horse to perform. Lauren rocks, as do all Ride IQ members. I'll quickly explain more about how Ride IQ works. First, you look through the app and choose a lesson based on your horse or a skill you're working on. There are lessons specifically for restarting OTTBs, lessons for nervous horses or horses that are behind the leg, as well as lessons that teach every stage of skills like shoulder in or lengthenings. Then you tack up and press play and you have a top coach like Doug Payne or Kyle Carter or Lawrence Bricer in your ear guiding you every step of the ride. If you'd like to learn more, visit ride-iq.com or start your two-week free trial by downloading the Ride IQ app on your iPhone or Android. Thanks for listening and have a wonderful rest of your day.